One of the best ways to support the FTF podcast is to check out our Patreon over at patreon.com slash finish the fight for exclusive episodes, insights, interviews, and plenty more. If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. Welcome back to Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. Where we produce and develop the highest quality gaming research in podcast form. I am your host, Alex Kendall. And I am your host, Derek Baker. And today, we're getting a little spooky with it. We are taking it back to the OG from Capcom that started it all as we see movie and show and remaster and remake coming out. And honestly, having such a beautiful retaking of the horror genre. Of course, I'm talking about Resident Evil. This is a franchise that I think has had a lot of really great games. That's why we see all these remasters. It's why you see, you know, all these films. I think there's like comic books as well. There's animation. There's all different Mm -hmm. styles for Resident Evil. It's a game that I think made an immediate impact. And then obviously you see how much it, stands out still even today yeah and and you see the intertwining stories they try and bring between them and the characters kind of revisiting and running into each other on later ones and the evolution of gameplay from that kind of tank control fixed camera into being more of that kind of open world survival we get into four into just kind of a crazy shoot em up in five and into six which we don't talk about <laughs> and then the, the kind of like reimagining in seven and eight um, that become this really crazy horror style gameplay that did shift that industry on its head and, and kind of brought in this whole new way to look at Resident Evil. And, you know, this game kind of ahead of its time in terms of the color scheming, because it basically gave us that Mexico filter. Mm-hmm. Just put that yellow over everything, make everything faded all those grays and browns that we got from that like 360 era of gaming that was already happening back for the resident evil from day one. Yeah. So let's jump right to it. Resident evil is a 1996 survival horror game developed and published by Capcom. The game was released from March to August originally for the PlayStation and players controlled Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine members of an elite task force known as stars who must escape a mansion infested with zombies and other monsters. Conceived by producer Tokuro Fujiwara as a remake of his earlier horror game Sweet Home from 1989, which also followed along with another movie called Sweet Home, same year, the development of Resident Evil was led by Shinji Mikami. It went through several redesigns, first as an SNES game in 1993, then a fully 3D first-person PlayStation game in 94, and finally, a third person game to wrap up the whole first to third to second to first to third. Gameplay consists of third person action with emphasis on inventory management, exploration, and puzzle solving. Resident Evil establishes many conventions seen later in the series, including the control scheme, inventory system, save system, and use of 3D models superimposed over pre rendered backgrounds. Resident Evil was praised for its graphics, gameplay, sound, and atmosphere, although it received criticism for its voice acting. It was an international bestseller and became the best-selling PlayStation game ever at the time. By December of 97, it had sold about 4 million copies worldwide and had grossed more than 200 million U.S. dollars. Resident Evil has since been hailed as one of the most influential and greatest video games of all time. It is credited with returning zombies to popular culture, leading to a renewed interest in zombie films during the 2000s. It created a franchise including video games, films, comics, novels, and other merchandise. It has been ported to Sega Saturn, Windows, and Nintendo DS. 
In 2002, a Resident Evil remake was released for the GameCube and imported to other platforms in 2015. A sequel, Resident Evil 2, was released in 1998, and a prequel, Resident Evil Zero, in 2002. Capcom's predecessor, IRM Corporation, was founded on May 30, 1979 by Kenzo Sujimoto, who was still president of IRM Corporation when he founded IRM. He worked concomitantly in both companies until leaving the former in 1983. The original companies that spawned Capcom's Japan branch were IRM and its subsidiary Japan Capsule Computers Company Limited, both of which were devoted to the manufacture and distribution of electronic game machines. The two companies underwent a name change to Sanbai Co. Limited in September 1981. On June 11, 1983, Sujimoto established Capcom Co. Limited for the purpose of taking over the internal sales department. In January 1989, Capcom Co. Limited merged with Sanbai Co. Limited, resulting in the current Japan branch. The name Capcom is a clipped compound of capsule computers, a term coined by the company for the arcade machines it solely manufactured in its early years, designed to set themselves apart from personal computers that were becoming widespread. Capsule alludes to how Capcom likened its game software to a capsule packed to the brim with gaming fun, and to the company's desire to protect its intellectual property with a hard outer shell preventing illegal copies and inferior imitations. Capcom's first product was the coin-operated arcade game Little League in 1983. It released its first real arcade video game, Volgus, in May of 1984. Starting with the arcade hit 1942, which came out in 1984, they began designing games with international markets in mind. The successful 1985 arcade games Commando and Ghosts and Goblins have been credited as the products, quote, that shot Capcom to 8-bit silicon stardom in the mid-1980s. Starting with the Commando, Capcom began licensing the arcade games for release on home computers, notably to British software houses Elite Systems and US Gold in the late 1980s. Beginning with the Nintendo Entertainment System port of 1942, the company ventured into the market of home console video games, which would eventually become its main business. The Capcom USA division had a brief stint in the late 1980s as a video game publisher for Commodore 64 and IBM PC DOS computers, although development of these arcade ports was handled by other companies. Capcom went on to create 15 multi-million selling home video game franchises, with the best selling being Resident Evil. And their highest grossing is the fighting game Street Fighter II, driven largely by its success in arcades. Resident Evil was created by a team of staff members who had later become part of Capcom Production Studio 4. The project's development began in 1993, and the game took three years to develop. The inspiration for Resident Evil was the earlier Capcom horror game Sweet Home. Shinji Mikami was commissioned to make a game set in a haunted mansion like Sweet Home, which Resident Evil was originally intended to be a remake of. The project was proposed by Sweet Home creator Tokuro Fujiwara, who was Mikami's mentor and served as the game's producer. Resident Evil was based on Sweet Home's gameplay system, adopting many elements from the game, including the limited item inventory management, the mansion setting, the puzzles, the emphasis on survival, the door loading screen, the use of scattered notes and diary entries as storytelling mechanics, multiple endings depending on how many characters survive, backtracking to previous locations in order to solve puzzles later on, the use of death animations, individual character items such as a lockpick or lighter, restoring health through items scattered across the mansion, the intricate layout of the mansion, and the brutally horrific imagery. Fujiwara said the basic premise was that I'd be able to do the things that I wasn't able to include in Sweet Home, mainly on the graphics front, and that he was confident that horror games could become a genre in themselves. He entrusted Mikami, who was initially reluctant because he hated being scared with the project, because he understood what's frightening. 
During the first six months of development, Mikami worked on the game alone, creating concept sketches, designing characters, and writing over 40 pages of script. The project was originally planned to be a horror game for the Super Nintendo before moving development to the PlayStation in 1994. Koji Oda was working on the Super NES Horror Project after having worked on Super Ghouls and Ghosts from 1991. Oda revealed that the setting was originally more of a hellish place before being changed to a more realistic setting. Part of the inspiration for limited ammunition came from the MSX port of the game Alcazar, The Forgotten Fortress, according to scenario writer Kenichi Iwao. The idea of having limited ammunition was inspired by the limited amount of supplies in the game's randomized dungeons. Iwao wanted to take more elements from the game, such as adding more ways to attack zombies with items such as mines and traps, but was unable due to schedule constraints. Now, several of the Resident Evil Mansion's pre-rendered backdrops were inspired by the Overlook Hotel, the setting for the 1980 horror film The Shining. Mikami also cited the 1979 film Zombie as a negative inspiration for the game. The game was initially conceived as a fully 3D first-person update of Sweet Home, influenced by the game's first-person battles with action and shooting mechanics. A first-person prototype was produced, and initially featured a supernatural, psychological Japanese horror style similar to Sweet Home, before opting for an American zombie horror style influenced by George Romero's films. During production, Mikami discovered Alone in the Dark, which influenced him to adopt a cinematic fixed-view camera system. Mikami said that, if it wasn't for Alone in the Dark, Resident Evil would have had a first-person view instead. Mikami was initially reluctant to adopt Alone in the Dark's fixed-view camera system, saying it, quote, had an effect on immersion, making the player feel a bit more detached, but eventually adopted it because the use of pre-rendered backdrops allowed a higher level of detail than his fully 3D first-person view prototype, which, quote, didn't get along so well with the original PlayStation specs. A concept art claimed to be of the original first-person prototype has been available since the 1990s, showing more similarity to Doom rather than Alone in the Dark. A first-person perspective was not used again for the mainline Resident Evil series until Resident Evil 7 Biohazard, which brought along that whole new look of the game. A later prototype featured cooperative gameplay, but this feature was eventually removed as Mikami said it technically wasn't good enough. Early footage of this co-op prototype was revealed in 1995. At this stage of development, a local co-op mode was present along with different outfits. A later demo made for the 1995 V-Jump Festival presentation in Japan featured real-time weapon changes with the co-op mode removed and rudimentary character models and textures. An early 1996 preview in Maximum Console magazine featured a graveyard and a slightly different version of the final boss. The graveyard, which was removed from the final game, eventually made it into the 2002 remake. Also featured in the game until late in development were guest houses and a tower, which were replaced by the guardhouse and the lab, respectively. Another feature that was removed from the final game was the real-time weapon changing from that earlier 1995 V-Jump demo. Capcom did not use any motion capture in the game, despite having their own motion capture studio. Instead, the animators referred to books and videos to study how people, spiders, and other animals encountered in the game move. In pre-production, other characters were conceived. Dewey, an African-American man, was intended to perform a comic relief role, while Gelzer, a big cyborg, was a typical strongman character. Both were later replaced by Rebecca and Barry, respectively. Almost all development was done on silicon graphics hardware using the software program Soft Image. The PlayStation was chosen as the lead platform because the development team felt it was the most appropriate for the game in terms of things such as the amount of polygons. The development team had upwards of 80 people towards the end of the game's development. According to Akio Sakai, head of Capcom's consumer software division, 
Capcom were hesitant to port Resident Evil to the Saturn because the hardware was not as ideally suited to the game as the PlayStation, ensuring the port would take a long time. A Saturn version was finally unveiled at the April 1997 Tokyo Game Show, at which Capcom also showed a demo for the sequel on PlayStation. The live-action full-motion video sequences were filmed in Japan with a cast of American actors. All Japanese releases contain English voice acting with Japanese captions and text. However, Japanese voice performances were also recorded but were left unused, as Mikami found the quality of the performances inadequate. However, lead programmer Yasuhiro Enpo later said that due to all of the development staff being Japanese, they were unaware of the poor localization that apparently hindered the realism and immersion of the title for the international release, which was one of the reasons for the redub in the 2002 remake. The original Japanese PlayStation version also features a vocal ending theme, Yumi the Arosensei, performed by Japanese rock artist Fumitaka Fujigami, which is not in any other versions of the game. Fujiwara said the game was originally targeted towards a core audience, and he only expected it to sell around 200,000 copies before the game went on to sell millions. Mikami said that he was a little worried about how well a horror game could really sell. Anpo said that Capcom did not expect the game to be successful. Biohazard was renamed for the North America and Europe markets after Chris Kramer, director of communications at Capcom, pointed out that it would be impossible to trademark the name in the United States. Among others, the 1992 video game Biohazard Battle and the New York alternative metal band Biohazard were already using the name. Capcom therefore ran an internal company contest to find a new name. The name Resident Evil was settled upon since the game takes place in a mansion. Kramer thought the name, quote, was super cheesy. Can't remember what I felt was a better alternative, probably something stupid about zombies. But the rest of the marketing crew loved it and were ultimately able to convince Capcom Japan and Mikami-san that the name fit, end quote. The cover artwork for the American and European release was done by artist Bill Sinkowicz. The original PlayStation version of Resident Evil went through several considerable changes between its original Japanese release and its international counterparts. The North American and European versions of the intro were heavily cut from the one featured in the Japanese releases. Shots of mangled corpses, a Cerberus zombie dog being shot, and Joseph's death were edited out, as well as scenes featuring the character Chris Redfield smoking a cigarette. Despite these tweaks, the game was ultimately released on the PlayStation as one of the first games to receive the Mature rating from the Entertainment Software Rating Board. In the game itself, the auto-aiming function was disabled and the numbers of ink ribbons found by the player were reduced. Capcom also planned to eliminate the interconnected nature of item boxes, meaning that items could only be retrieved from the locations where they were originally stored. This change made it in preview copies of the U.S. version, but was removed from the retail release. This particular game mechanic would resurface in its remake as part of an unlockable difficulty setting. Shinji Mikami noted that they made the American version harder at the request of the American staff so that the game could be rented and not completed in a few days. Mikami said that this version proved fairly difficult for Capcom staff, who had to play very carefully to complete it. Now, when it came to the marketing, as we talked about, there was a demo, and a trial version of the game, Biohazard Trial Edition, was released in Japan in late 1995. This version of the game had bloody writing on certain walls around the mansion, which would allude to the story background when examined. The concept of the blood writing was almost entirely removed, save for a brief flick of blood in the main hall. When Street Fighter Alpha Warrior's Dreams was released in the United Kingdom in May 1996, HMV sold copies containing a demo disc for Resident Evil. According to the disc's cover, it was a promotional exchange disc and could be exchanged at HMV for a copy of the full game upon release, with the price reduced by £5. We also had a comic tie-in, and in April 1996, Marvel Comics published an original prequel comic to the game. This non-canon story 
tells the story of Bravo team member Richard Aiken's exploration of the Spencer Mansion, along with Albert Wesker receiving his orders from Umbrella to send stars out to their deaths. The issue ends with Alpha Team being sent out into Raccoon Forest to investigate the loss of contact with Bravo Team. There was also a novelization of the game titled Resident Evil, The Umbrella Conspiracy Side A. It was written by author Stefani Donnell Perry as the first book in her series of Resident Evil novels. The novel combines both Jill and Chris's scenarios into one narrative, and features all five of the main characters, including Barry and Rebecca. The book also takes liberty with the original source materials, the most notable difference being the inclusion of an original character named Trent, an insider from Umbrella who provides Jill with information about the mansion prior to the events of the mansion incident. Since the book was written a few years before the GameCube remake, the novelization omits the presence of Lisa Trevor in the mansion. However, the book does allude to the original version of George Trevor's journal from the true story behind Biohazard, as well as the short story it contained, Biohazard The Beginning, which involved the disappearance of Chris's friend, Billy Rabbitson. Another notable difference in the novels is moving the location of Raccoon City from the Midwest to Pennsylvania, apparently about an hour's drive from New York. Now dim the lights. It's story time. On July 24th, 1998, when a series of bizarre murders occurs on the outskirts of the fictional Midwestern town of Raccoon City, the Raccoon City Police Department's STARS team are assigned to investigate. After contact with Bravo team is lost, Alpha team is sent to investigate their disappearance. Alpha team locates Bravo team's crashed helicopter and land at the site, where they are suddenly attacked by a pack of monstrous dogs, killing team member Joseph Frost. After Alpha Team's helicopter pilot, Brad Vickers, panics and takes off alone, the remaining members of the team, Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine, Albert Wesker, and Barry Burton, are forced to seek refuge in a nearby abandoned mansion. Depending on which character the player assumes control of, either Chris or Barry, are separated from the rest of the team during the chase and do not make it to the mansion. At this point, the team decides to split up to investigate. Over the course of the game, the player character may encounter several members of Bravo Team, including Enrico Marini, the captain of the Bravo Team, who reveals that one of Alpha Team's members is a traitor before being shot and killed by an unseen assailant. The player character eventually learns that a series of illegal experiments were being undertaken by a clandestine research team under the authority and supervision of biomedical company Umbrella Corporation. The creatures roaming the mansion and its surrounding areas are the results of these experiments, which have exposed the mansion's personnel and various animals and insects to a highly contagious and mutagenic biological agent known as the T-virus. Eventually, the player character discovers a secret underground laboratory containing Umbrella's experiments. In the lab, the player encounters Wesker, who reveals that he is a double agent working for Umbrella and plans to use the tyrant a giant humanoid super soldier, to kill the remaining STARS members. However, in the ensuing confrontation, Wesker is supposedly killed, and the player character defeats the tyrant. After activating the lab's self-destruct system, the player character reaches the heliport and manages to contact Brad for extraction, at which point the player may be confronted by Tyrant one last time. The game features multiple endings, depending on the player's actions at key points over the course of the game. An updated version, Resident Evil Director's Cut, was released for PlayStation in September 1997, a year and a half after the original game. Director's Cut was produced to compensate for the highly publicized delay of the sequel, Resident Evil 2, and was originally bundled with a playable pre-release demo of that game. The Japanese version of the demo disc also included a pre-release demo of Rockman Neo, later retitled Rockman Dash, Mega Man Legends outside of Japan, and a trailer for the newly released Breath of Fire 3. The main addition to Director's Cut is an arranged version of the game that changes the location of nearly every vital item in the mansion, as well as the enemy placement. The main characters, as well as Rebecca, are given a new wardrobe, and the player's handgun is replaced by an improved model 
where any shot fired has a random chance of decapitating a zombie, killing it instantly. The original version of the game is included as well, along with a new beginner mode where the enemies are easier to kill and the amount of ammunition that can be found by the player is doubled. Additionally, the auto-aim function was restored in all modes, though it is not noted in the in-game controls. The North American and European releases of the Director's Cut were marketed as featuring the original, uncensored footage from the Japanese releases. However, the full motion video sequences were still censored, and Capcom claimed the omission was the result of a localization mistake made by the developers. The game's localization was handled by Capcom Japan instead of Capcom USA, and when submitted to Sony Computer Entertainment America, it was rejected because of one line of copyright text. Rather than remove the individual line, Capcom Japan decided to save time and simply swap in the cinematics from the U.S. release of the original Resident Evil. Sony Computer Entertainment America then approved the game and manufactured a full production run without Capcom USA having any idea that the uncensored scenes had been cut. Three days after the game's release, the uncensored intro was offered as a free download from their website. The French and German PAL versions of Director's Cut do feature the uncensored intro, full motion video in color, though they lacked the uncensored Kenneth death scene. Although the PC version of Resident Evil was not billed as the Director's Cut version of the game, it is the only version of Resident Evil that has all of the uncensored videos, which includes the uncensored introduction, Kenneth's death scene in its entirety and ending as well. There was also a third version for the PlayStation, DualShock version, co-produced by Kaiji Inafune and was released in August 1998. It features support for the DualShock controller's analog controls and vibration functions, as well as a new symphonic soundtrack, replacing the original soundtrack by Makato Tamazawa, Kochi Hiroki, and Masami Ueda. The symphonic music was credited to composer Mamoru Samaraguchi, although he admitted in 2014 that he directed his orchestra Takashi Nagaki as a ghostwriter for the new soundtrack. So a little, uh, little thing going on there. The Japanese DualShock version came packaged with a bonus disc that contained downloadable saved data, footage of the unused Japanese dubbed versions of the live action cutscenes, along with brief gameplay footage of the cancelled original version of Resident Evil 2. The soundtrack was generally deemed inferior to the original, with the ambient theme for the mansion's basement considered to be one of the worst video game compositions of all time. In 1998, Capcom USA released the game for $19.99 under the greatest hits. And in North America, Resident Evil Director's Cut Dual Shock version was later released as a DLC game available for the PlayStation Network, although the game is advertised with the original Director's Cut box art. In Japan and Europe, the original Director's Cut was instead made available from the PlayStation Network. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. The Sega Saturn version added an unlockable battle mode in which the player must traverse through a series of rooms from the main game and eliminate all enemies within them with the weapons selected by the player. It features two exclusive enemies not in the main game, a zombie version of Wesker and a gold-colored tyrant. The player's performance in the battle mode is graded at the end. The game's backgrounds were touched up to include more detail in this version. The Japanese version is the most gore-laden of all the platforms. After decapitating a crawling zombie with a kick, the head remains on the floor, and Plant 42 can cut the character before the game over screen. The Saturn version also features exclusive enemy monsters, such as a reskinned breed of hunters known as Ticks, and a second tyrant prior to the game's final battle in Chris's game. 
Exclusive outfits for Jill and Chris were added as well. This version was published in Europe by Sega instead of Capcom's usual European publisher, Virgin. The Windows version featured the uncensored footage from the Japanese version, and the opening intro is in full color rather than black and white. Support for 3D accelerator cards was added as well, allowing for much sharper graphics. Two new unlockable weapons were added, a MAC-10 for Jill and an FN Mini-Me for Chris. New unlockable outfits for Chris and Jill were added as well, and the PC version skips the door animations. There is also a Game Boy Color version of the game, developed by the software house Hotgen which was supposed to be released in late 1999 or early 2000 until Capcom decided to cancel this project, citing that the port was poor quality due to the Game Boy's limited hardware. This version contains every room, cutscene, and almost all of the items that were present in the original PlayStation version. In January 2012, an anonymous individual claimed to have an EP-ROM cartridge of the Game Boy Color version and requested $2,000 before he was willing to leak the playable ROM. The goal was met in February, and the ROM files containing an unfinished build of the game were subsequently leaked. Then we also had a Nintendo DS port, Resident Evil Deadly Silence, which was released in Japan as Biohazard Deadly Silence, and was made to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the series. Deadly Silence includes a classic mode, which is the original game with minimal enhancements and touchscreen support, and a rebirth mode, containing a greater number of enemies and a series of new puzzles that make use of the platform's capabilities. The game makes use of the dual screen display with the top screen used to display the map, along with the player's remaining ammunition and health, determined by the color of the background, while the bottom screen displays the main action and can be switched to show the player's inventory. The DS version also includes updated play mechanics. The 180 degree turn introduced in Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, along with the knife button and tactical reload from Resident Evil 4. The updated controls are applicable to both classic and rebirth modes. Just like the PC version, the door animations can be skipped as well as the cutscenes. The live action footage was still censored, even in the game's Japanese release. However, the scene showing Kenneth's severed head was kept. In Rebirth, new puzzles are added that use the system's touchscreen. Knife battle sequences viewed from a first-person perspective are also added, in which the player must fend off incoming enemies by swinging the knife via the stylus. One particular puzzle requires the player to resuscitate an injured comrade by blowing into the built-in microphone. The player can also shake off enemies by using the touchscreen performing a melee attack. The game also includes wireless LAN support for up to four players, with two different multiplayer game modes. The first is a cooperative mode in which each player must help each other solve puzzles and escape the mansion together. The other is a competitive mode in which the objective is to get the highest score out of all the players by destroying the most monsters, with the tougher monsters being worth more points. There are three playable multiplayer stages and nine playable characters. In 2002, Resident Evil was remade for the GameCube as part of an exclusivity agreement between Capcom and Nintendo that spanned three new games. The remake includes a variety of new gameplay elements, environments, and story details, as well as improved visuals and sound. The game was also later ported for the Wii in 2008. A remastered version of the remake featuring high-definition graphics was released as a download for the PS3, PS4, Windows, Xbox 360, Xbox One in 2015, with a limited edition PS3 version released at retail in Japan. Now, as we know, Resident Evil was a bestseller in Japan, North America, and Europe, including the United Kingdom. In the United States, the game sold over 1 million copies by early September of 1996, becoming a system seller for the PlayStation and increasing its install base at the time. In Europe, the game shipped 230,000 units on its first day of release, with 21,500 sold on its first weekend in the United Kingdom, where it was one of the fastest-selling CD releases up until then. The game went on to sell at least more than 300,000 units in Europe by December of 1996. Now, by December of 97, the game had sold about 4 million units worldwide 
and grossed more than $200 million, which was equivalent to $330 million in 2020. According to Capcom's Investor Relations website, the original version of Resident Evil has sold over 2.75 million copies, while the Director's Cut version, including the DualShock edition, sold an additional 2.33 million copies. All PlayStation versions of the game have sold a combined 5.08 million units worldwide. GameSpot listed Resident Evil as one of the 15 most influential video games of all time. It is credited with defining and popularizing the survival horror genre of games. It is also credited with taking video games in a cinematic direction with its B-movie style cutscenes. Its live-action opening, however, was controversial. It became one of the first action games to receive the mature 17 plus M rating from the Entertainment Software Rating Board, or the ESRB, despite the opening cutscene being censored in North America. Chicago Tribune said it revolutionized gaming in 1997. Resident Evil is credited with sparking a revival of the zombie genre in popular culture since the late 1990s, leading to a renewed interest in zombie films during the 2000s. Resident Evil also played an important role in the zombie genre shift from supernatural themes to scientific themes, using science to explain the origins of zombies. In 2013, George Romero said it was the video games Resident Evil and the House of the Dead more than anything else that popularized zombies in early 21st century pop culture. In a 2015 interview with Huffington Post, screenwriter-director Alex Garland credited the original Resident Evil video game as a primary influence on his script for the horror film 28 Days Later, released in 2002, and credited the first Resident Evil game for revitalizing the zombie genre. Shaun of the Dead star and co-writer Simon Pegg also credits the original Resident Evil game with starting the zombie revival. After the original Resident Evil video game sparked a renewed interest in that genre, it was followed by zombie films such as 28 Days Later, Dawn of the Dead, Shaun of the Dead, 28 Weeks Later, Zombieland, Cockneys vs. Zombies, and World War Z, as well as zombie-themed graphic novels and television shows such as The Walking Dead and The Returned, and books such as World War Z, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, and Warm Bodies. The Resident Evil film adaptations also went on to become the highest grossing film series based on video games after they grossed more than $1 billion worldwide. The zombie revival trend was popular up until the mid-2010s before zombie films declined in popularity by the late 2010s. And are still making a comeback as we see more and more come out with this and more and more come out just with Resident Evil in and of itself having a new show on Netflix that is a questionable show, (laughs) but also having a great anime that came out along with it. Um, So yeah, I mean, as as we kind of wrap up the facts, the nitty gritty, the info with this, Derek, let's talk to the people and let them know why did we choose Resident Evil and what do we think of it? Yeah, a lot to say on this one. I think more for its influence on those genres, Mm -hmm. as we talked about. You know, it's hard to look at games that came out as long ago as this one did in the 90s, and really look at it and judge it based on, like, gameplay and all those things. Like, it was cool for the time. It was really neat for the time. And, you know, it's gotten remasters and things like that. You know, try to modernize it because it's so iconic. There's going to be, you know, gaps, even when you do stuff like that. One of the things that I found really interesting um, that we talked about at the beginning of the episode was... The inspiration from the Overlook Hotel. Yes. I actually watched an episode of Ghost Adventures yesterday where they they investigated, which if you haven't seen Ghost Adventures, it's so absurd. Just a bunch of bros <laughs> yeah. like doing ghost hunting, like trying to fight ghosts. It's so absurd. Highly entertaining. Love it. But they investigated the Stanley Hotel, which was the inspiration for the Overlook Hotel, which was the inspiration for the mansion mm-hmm. in this Resident Evil. So it's all really, really fresh in my mind. But if you want to see that real life inspiration, see if there's any sort of uh, comparisons that that really truly exist within those three things being transferable, you should go watch that episode. But um, I thought that that was really cool, you know, just borrowing from 
genres and, and borrowing from reality. And I think trying to make Resident Evil have that more realistic approach. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, where it's like, yes, trying to base this stuff in reality. And Sweet Home, which, funny enough, actually has, uh, it became a show on Netflix. It's a fantastic show. Definitely recommend checking it out, taking a lot of that homage from the earlier movie and video game from it. Uh, but yeah, Resident Evil grounded itself. And I think that makes sense. And it makes it so much, and it really brought the genre to where it is into reality. Because talking about them like wanting more of a hellish landscape to start, to eventually bring it to more of this realistic element to it, it grounds it. And it almost makes it a what-if scenario. Like, this is plausible. Versus just going to the gates of hell and fighting stuff. It's more like, hey, right. this is a mutagen that this organization was secretly developing and testing on people that screws with genes. And you're kind of thinking to yourself, like, it's plausible. It's an idea. And that's what they develop more into the movies and further games and, and further TV shows. So, yeah, I mean, it's definitely a great point with that. I mean, it's got Last of Us, you know, written all over it, all those things that it was saying, like the, the scientific basis, because it used to be supernatural, like there's a curse on this land and like the zombies are mm -hmm. popping up out of the ground and it's like actual corpses that are coming. And then they just change that entire thing where it's, you know, it's not necessarily corpses. It's like a living person that's been infected with some sort of disease. Yes. And yeah, that is a more plausible thing than a dead person, you know, coming back to life after hundreds of years in the ground. You know, there's there's that realism that I think invokes a sense of fear that can't be invoked by things that are so absurdly supernatural that you know that that there's just not truth and reality in them. So I think that that's really interesting. And, and the influence from Resident Evil in that regard is super cool. I also think it's funny that they were asked to make this game harder so yes. that, you know, like you couldn't go to Blockbuster and just beat it for the five bucks or whatever to rent it for the five days and just beat it and return it. They're like, no, we need, we need to make sure people want to buy this game. So we need you to make it harder. Like what a, what a 90s problem to have. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we definitely see more of that in modern gaming too. New game plus, new game plus plus, insane mode, demon mode, all these things of, of getting that challenge of like, hey, I want the hardest aspect ever on this game. I want realism mode. I want these to be the hardest things. And that's definitely much more of an American audience thing that kind of branched out to, to other nations, but very much that like, I need to get my money's worth and I need to be the best <laughs> at it. So give me the hardest option you can. And it's also really interesting culturally to look at Resident Evil as a franchise because I feel like it follows such a specific pathway that has really, it, it, like it, it really shows how our media is organized now in pop culture like mm -hmm. you have this game that's just being made as like an improvement on a game that already exists right there's not all this like intense lore and things so they're they're doing these other outside things to go in with it like comic books and movies and they're doing these novelizations as well but there's not like a specific bible of lore mm -mm. and they kind of have to like make that stuff up as it goes along so like we talked about the novelization that has all these inconsistencies and stuff because like things in the nineties, they like, they were really put in for novelty. Yes. You know, it's like, here's this accompanying piece of extra media. If you want it, there wasn't this like large expansive world being built, but now like you get that with so many things where it's like, okay, yeah, we've got this, but what is, what is this person's motivation specifically? You know, these creatures that are in there, like, how did they come to be? There was all that stuff that back when Resident Evil came out, you didn't need the explanations for all that stuff. And multiple people can just make their own uh, viewpoint of whatever they want that to be. And yeah, like if you wanted to buy that, you can. We start to get games shift now, more so into the 2000s, to be story driven. Again, they're talking about, and you had brought this up in an earlier paragraph, that basically it's Sweet Home, but not Sweet Home. It has about 
40 different characteristics that are very similar that they've taken from it. And the idea of leaving those notes and leaving these story elements that uh, we see in modern day games all over, whether uh, collect them all as achievements or a side story, or in some cases, um, it's the full story written into the side of it that that's the true ending is if you piece all of the information together. So I like the idea of like, hey, you're tossed in, you're following Bravo team, you find a mansion. What's going on? And so it slowly is revealed through those context clues and notes and diary entries. And even if you skip all those, you get a general idea of what's happening, you know, through dialogue and through Wesker and all that. But having those just gives so much more of that reveal of just how deep this has gone, how long this has gone on, and the idea of like wiping out these different forces to allow this to spread and 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 to get into Raccoon City, to get into the different portions of the idea of Resident Evil as it expands out into the further games, I think is such forward thinking and such a cool idea. Even for a company that's like, this is not going to do well. Horror does not sell. We know even today, like horror movies, unless you are a staple or you follow an exact formula, you have to either get extremely lucky or just know you're not going to make your budget back or it has to be cheap. And so when you're making a horror game, it's like, man, we're rolling the dice. And so it's really cool to see how this as a genre evolved, how this as a franchise has evolved and evolved with the times. It hasn't tried to make the same game each time. It's tried to make improvements or adapt to current gaming trends in a good way, not just trying to jump on a bandwagon, but to do it in their own way is is fantastic. Right. And especially, you know... (laughs) Got to adapt that DS version. Got to blow into that microphone. Like <laughs> yes. how many? How many games did that? It was so many that it's were just insane. like, ah, oh, Nintendo put a microphone in the system. We should definitely use that, right? Yeah, no, we definitely should. What should we do? <laughs> just have them blow into the microphone because it's not going to understand what they're saying. You can't like talk. No, it's going to come out all garbled. But yeah, just blow into that. So yeah. Full, full, expansive experience, always trying to improve with the times. I just think it's really cool to look at this as like the whole big picture Mm -hmm. and not just the video game Resident Evil. Also, shout out uh, Bill Sinkowicz for doing the uh, artwork for this OG Resident Evil comic book artist um, that he basically, uh, he was a big part of early Moon Knight. So okay, it's like okay. all those darker themes, and he, he's really well known for doing that stuff. He also did Legion, uh, has its own TV show mm-hmm. as an X-Men character. Love when those worlds intertwine when you get, you know, like those early, I think it was like Dragon Quest was using, I think it was Ken Sugimori, but who did all the Pokemon artwork and stuff. But yeah, mm-hmm. lo- love when that kind of stuff intertwines. This game for me... It's like a 7 out of 10. The game itself like just has that dated like PlayStation feel, but it it just changed so many things. Like that that almost just doesn't even matter because it just as a franchise and as an experience changed so many things about the future in terms of pop culture media mm-hmm. that it's it's importance in that world is 10 out of 10. Yeah, I mean, again, numbers make no sense. But the true ratings for this, it's it, seven point three four five. Repeating, of course, nine 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 <laughs> nine. Repeating. That's a very scientific calculation. I've got it in my Excel spreadsheet right here. Beautiful. But yeah, you know, you're you're right. It it is very dated. If you've never played the OG, I, I say don't. I say play some of the remasters that allow for these modern day controls because those kind of tankish controls, the fixed cameras. Same thing with Silent Hill. It is very hard to get into, and, they're, and the remakes they're making now for all these different Resident Evils, in my opinion, are fantastic. I think they're updating them in the ways that they should and still keeping the charm of the originals. But yeah, it's, it's a fantastic game. Um, I don't recommend the show. This is Slash Now, the Resident Evil show podcast. It's um, awful. I finished the first episode and decided... Uh, I was done. It is Watch that Castlevania. Bad. Watch Castlevania, a much better 80s, 90s-esque franchise that did gaming right. Just do that. That's my rating. I'm going to rate it out of the show, 
bad. The game and franchise that is brought with it, very good, very interesting stories that are intertwined behind it. I love the mix of characters in the later genres, or the later games, I should say. Um, I, I think it's, it's a great way that they take the game and they brought it back from six, which for a lot of people is very much the, the furthest traction they've taken away from the game. Some people like six, a lot of people don't. But then when seven and eight, like eight with the village um, came out, people said they brought that back. So if I had to give it, I would give it a don't watch the show, watch Castlevania, but go ahead and play the remakes, play the original if you played it, if you want out of 10. I think you and I played a little bit of Resident Evil 5 together back yeah. in the day. I, little, I liked it. I mean, it's, it's, it definitely is not Resident Evil in my opinion. Yeah. I think it's much more of a zombie mass shooter that is a very fun co-op game that gets silly yeah. as all the Resident Evils do once you do New Game Plus and you have unlimited ammo and crazy guns. Then it's a fun time to play it and you're not as scared. But yeah, it's, it's a fun game. Definitely not the core Resident Evil side i think it took four and went really far with it but it's still a fun game yeah definitely still fun it it has like a such a weird like open-ended i don't know like it just like a dirt feel it almost feels like you you took the call of duty modern warfare world and just dropped resident evil into it pretty that's much that's kind of what it reminds me of i could definitely agree with that Research for this episode was done by Alex Kendall and Derek Baker. The intro and outro music for this episode was given to us, recorded, written by our friend Evan Barr, and our lovely artwork was provided by Aaron Shattuck. I want to thank those beautiful people, as well as the beautiful people on our Patreon. You can check us out at patreon.com slash finish the fight. I want to thank a few select members today with Snide T-Bird, Nick Hyman, and Anthony Gooch. Thank you all so much for your support, and you're wonderful. You can follow this podcast on Instagram, Twitter. We're also on Discord. Alex and I are hanging out in there all the time. There's a link to join in the description below, and we'd love to see you there. As always, you can check us out on Twitch. You can see me at twitch.tv slash sourman70. That's twitch.tv slash S-O-U-R-M-A-N-7-0, as well as Derek over at twitch.tv slash thebakerman247. That is twitch.tv slash thebakerman247. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or most likely your favorite podcast listening platform. If you haven't yet, please drop us a review. It helps us out a lot, and we love to hear from you. And with that, this has been our coverage of Capcom's Resident Evil. Is there another horror game you think we should cover? Is there something that has done so great and so bad as some of the Resident Evil properties? Let us know on our socials, and uh, we'll try and add it to the list. And with that, again, I am your host, as always, Alex Kendall. And I am your host, Rebecca. And this has been Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. <laughs>